So, uh, as you know, Shimaru has been in the business of content for the last five decades <coughs> uh, across various platforms and across various genres of content. We actually have taken learnings of all our experience over the last 55 years and uh, brought that all into the OTT app that we've created, OTT platform that we've created called Shimaru. Uh, the premise actually has been that uh, we've always seen that the beauty of our content is that it's been organically consumed over and over again. Our repeat watching has been tremendous even on a platform like YouTube where we get 3 billion views a month. 3 billion, 3 billion views a month on YouTube just from organic traffic alone. And we don't spend a dime on, on driving any of that traffic. We also look at our watch times, we also look at our repeat viewing. And that's what actually gave us a lot of insights to, dis to decide and say, okay, you know what, there's a huge base of customers and users who actually look at uh, content from a very different angle. There's one breed, and the entire breed is sitting here itself, which says, uh, new, original, latest, and the likes. And then there's the other lot, which is, I want to be in my skin, I want to be in my comfort zone, and I want to get something that I've watched over and over again, many, many times. And the beauty is that people are willing to pay for that as well. So for example, if I have a classic category on Bollywood, in the last three months of launch, we have actually seen some tremendous offtake on just the classic pack. It's a, it's a 49 rupee a month and a 500 rupee a year pack only for the classic cinema, classic Bollywood pack. And we've seen some amazing offtake just organically on that one pack. What we basically do is use YouTube as a platform to drive uh, snippets of content there and then drive the final uh, viewing of the entire content on the platform. And that's where we are getting our early traction on the platform from. Let me, let me push you a little more on this. Do you feel that you have a kind of a more kind of a clearer vision since you come after all the learnings of all the players or you believe they have a small advantage? Not really. I think there's enough uh, space for everyone. And, uh, but when on the mobile phone, mobile phone is very limited space for multiple apps. So on the mobile phone itself, there are a lot of players and a lot of there's a lot of reason for everyone to take content. And today, if you look at it, everyone has a mobile and there's enough and more room for people to buy that mobile again and again. So mobile phones or whether it's content, everyone has a space. We see it very clearly. And uh, our, there are two ways to look at it. So one way is, of course, being to see and go directly to segments, different segments of different needs. Whether it's devotional as a need, whether it's kids as a need, or whether it's classics as a need. So we go after those needs and regional. So Gujarati is a huge uh, offering that we offer. So every such category has a need for sure, and we go after capitalizing on that particular hotel of smaller segments. What's happening in Gujarati? I, I heard of you. Can also be launched in Gujarati. You have a very strong Gujarati service. Is there a new revelation because a lot of people kind of ignore this pocket for a while? Gujarati has been a, a low supply market on content. Movies has been low. Uh, but what we have capitalized on is movies and artworks, which is the big draw in the Gujarati space. Right now, we've got probably about 70% of the available content in the market as far as Gujarati is concerned. And all of that is sitting on our uh, current platform. We promise uh, some new content every other week to a customer on the platform, which is why we've seen some amazing traction on that as well. So, so we've been late at the of the week because I used to run a travel channel, and any travel show, 40% of your show would come from Gujarati. Uh, and they would love the travel show. So I think, to your point, having a supply side and a response side is really good. You have, of course, I mean, Z5 has a tremendous growth story. I mean, in the sense, the growth, the numbers, and the pace is kind of unmatched. You have an inherent advantage coming from other, you know, from Z Group, which is kind of known for its content. You have, I don't know, 60, 70 channels, 40, 50,000 hours of original content coming onto your platform, plus your original, which is kind of coming one of these kind of pace. So, do you think you are at strategic advantage? Is that the reason you kind of are growing at the pace you are? Strategic advantage. Definitely because we leverage the strength of the network. We have a huge consumer base that comes to the platform to catch up all the Z network shows. IPL, no IPL, this just keeps going. Nothing has really affected our numbers. Anything traditional has not affected our numbers at all. So definitely there is a strategic advantage. 
being from the house of broadcaster. The originals and the movies, the latest movie strategy is of course to open up newer audiences, the audiences over and above your regular television viewing audiences definitely to become your platform. But the, you're a new true person in sense, if I may say in front of this, because I always want to understand how do you differentiate between television content sitting on, on the web and original content created for web. This sit in many platforms, including yours, and on the same level. How do you see them differently from a creative lens? I think for us, I think the big thing is that uh, we're not playing the app download game because that's how you got your next player. That's the big thing that uh, we've kind of jumped that by by. That's why we're operating at a scale which is about 75 million daily actors and 175 million monthly actors. So we already have those consumers who are the five Android phones already have us in their phones. We just need to make them uh, uh, know that there is a stream option now. So as those who might be sorry. And very tell them about let's from a, so the reason why I said all that is because at scale uh, there is a huge amount uh, India is a, it's a content hungry country. You cannot uh, probably give them say ten shows and then expect all ten shows to work at that scale. So for us, from a strategic content strategic point of view, we've got uh, Sony of course as a partner and most people who ever created web series, whether it be TVF, Dice, Pocket Aces. Anybody who is able to partner with us, right, to give them that level of scale to be able to reach that level of consumers is one end of the spectrum. And the second end of the spectrum is actually now trying to understand these consumers, understand what they're looking at, what they're consuming, how they're consuming, and then develop a full-fledged original strategy to cater to those needs. states. So for us, I think both are critical because both are huge learning curves. And then basis those learning that we understand, we try and create an entire original strategy. Ali, you know, heroes has entertained millions for many, many decades. But you don't have a broadcast business. You don't have, I mean, you of course don't have how many have business recently. How would you kind of explain the journey of heroes and, and the vision that you hold, which will differentiate you from the rest? Sure. Um, I think it kind of starts from taking a step back, right? Um, I think it's about identifying in terms of what you believe consumers would be willing to pay for, and there are consumers who be not willing to pay for certain content, right? And that comes from the deep inside that if you're watching Charlie with my finger or dogs on skates, both are you willing to pay a subscription for that content or not? And I think that's where the kind of origination comes from. So Eros with the kind of legacy of saying that we've been potentially one of the first vertically integrated studios in the country with IP of over 12,000 films across 10 languages has the biggest kind of repository of being able to dip into the consumer's pocket to demand a subscription price, right? And that's the reason why we're live and getting, paying customers from 135 countries around the world, not just India. So I think that's the premise of why this business, because you've got broadcast players, essentially, whose primary business runs, and I think against that, whose primary business runs of television reach on GC audiences across the country, which is run by a combination of subscription and advertising. Um, we don't have that legacy in terms of a broadcast business which actually becomes an advantage because you essentially have qualitative viewing for new movies and movies, as the partner also mentioned, tend to become one of the largest draw patterns and consumption patterns in terms of repeat viewership. Uh, with that experience, we actually take our learning, uh, kind of dipping into um, what Amazon is trying to do, primarily is trying to do, is look at how you're able to create a premium experience uh, with all the kind of movie production, creative experience of driving original programming to that level. Right? So for example, we launched a show on Modi. Uh, traditionally, you would have Mumbai Delhi Bangalore coming in as one of your top three cities, but the number of city, number one city of viewership was Kandabar. Um, so I'm just giving you an example of potentially we being able to actually attract newer audiences to the internet and internet video for the first time where Ahmedabad doesn't feature in the top 10 cities in any marketing content campaign uh, for the first time with a show like Modi. So what we're doing is kind of taking the movie uh, kind of catalog which is more mass market and then trying to create a more younger audience with the same values of experience with some of the auditions that we've done and whether it was stuff we did with Flip with Bijoy or whether it was Modi with the White Shukla or whether it was Small, I'm saying that's what we've got to learn better with each show that we've launched in the last six months. I hear, I mean, you, know, you mentioned about international 135 country mentioned about deeper pockets into Gujarat and Punjab. 
you know, you had an early start, obviously, and you had a phenomenal success on Amazon Prime. Uh, how do you see when more players are coming in? I mean, is there pressure on you to kind of move more faster, or you kind of uh, want to see how they fare and learn from them? Uh, what, what is your opinion on the more players coming in? Well, not, not really, there's absolutely no pressure. I think our singular focus has and will always remain the customer. For us, everything we do, all the decisions we take, and every bit of uh, product experience content that you see, and the value that we try to drive is driven from our constant understanding of uh, the customer's tastes and preferences as it exists today, and being able to evolve with that because it is entertainment after all. You know, they will get more discerning as you tell more stories and so on and so forth. So you, and I didn't speak about the very Indians. Yeah. The taste and preferences change. So we remain very committed and driven by understanding your you know, needs today. And if you look at how we've gone about building this out, it follows a very, a very uh, easy to understand pattern. Firstly, we believe an uh, interesting stat is that A.I. and Amazon iron delivers to 99.9% of the pin codes in India. Which then makes it very exciting for us because we like we like to believe that we will want to cover the length and breadth of the country as well, as well, right? Um, and if that's the case, then we've got to be driven by time. We've got to be able to give them the latest and the greatest movies because movies build familiarity and the be doing this, as my colleagues have just touched upon. But what's also interesting is that movies draw people into a new service and allow it to become a habit. Right? Because um, there is, it comes with a bit of awareness, it comes with a certain level of expectation. There is a price comparison they make for the time. There is no place for consumers to access it. And if you look at uh, the success that we've had, right from Inside Edge, which is our very first show, to more recently, uh, Fomo Shot Cube and, and Made in Heaven, and there's up for all these shows, um, we've really committed to the cinematic ambition, you know, finite fiction heavily serialized, the potential of multiple seasons. And what we have learned here is that it's a craft that takes time. You know, so you can't rush it. You can't expect to be doing it uh, just because there's this innate demand from customers and, and try and cut a few corners. We recognize that it only stays cinematic if you're able to give it the time it, it takes to be able to bring it uh, you know, in its full glory. And so I think, <coughs> We're going to stay committed to doing all of this stuff. And uh, as long as we have the word of confidence from our customers, and we believe that uh, you know, we're giving them the good value, which is, and believe me, our customers are very open. Yes. They tell us what they like and what they don't like, and, and it all happens in real time. And uh, I think that's really what drives us. And I believe the opportunity, as I said, is just getting, we're just about getting started. I would like to believe this is true for everyone. You mentioned earlier also many countries, many India, one India. India. Are the sensibilities of Bharat and India from the consumer point of view are they different? I mean, you plan content, create content kind of differently from the two? They're even more nuanced. I think Bharat and India is kind of simplifying it. Okay. All right. Uh, it's way more nuanced. Uh, I think the, the magic here is that if you tell a great story, um, you've noticed that the more authentic you are to the roots of the story, the more uh, it travels, right. you know. I mean, Mirzapur has fans from Coimbatore and Dachi. Right. Uh, and one would argue when you're sitting uh, developing the show that, hey, this is not even going to be understood by people who speak regular Hindi, right? So I think that's the magic. But you have to keep in mind that even when you're creating content, say, in Tamil, what will work with in Madurai will be deeply nuanced versus what is possible in Chennai. And, and I think that's, that's just the name of the game now. And the beauty is that creators have the opportunity to actually do this without any of any of the economic constraints around it. Right. Okay, but the one is, of course, you know, same content of multiple languages, and of course, to this point, the, the story could be from you know, any part of the country. It is done well. It can resonate across the world, as we've seen in many content cases. You, of course, have a lot of original content going in time, especially now, and perhaps in Bangla later. When you kind of think of Tamil as an audience, or Telugu as an audience, or what's not only as an audience, what are the kind of uh, filters you apply which are any different? Be it storytelling and narrative, but of course, no one can take away the credit from that. But how true the story is to its roots? Is it a story that is meant to be told in Tamil? Will it largely cater to my Tamil speaking audience? 
And in fact, it's not anymore just language or, 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 or a city or a particular demographic anymore. It's a segment of one almost for all of us. So if it's a great comment show, we not just see uh, those in uh, Chennai or other parts of Tamil Nadu or Sri Lanka or Singapore consume it. We have a lot more audiences even nationally which want to sample the look of this show. We recently launched a show called Auto Shopper. Um, it, has had, uh, it has had such phenomenal uh, response from across the country. So it's not remained only a Tamil show anymore. Uh, I just want to add a point here because I know while we are talking about all the content we are creating, it's important to understand and also recognize that there is a shift with, when it comes to authenticity. If you look at the success of a recent Kannada film called KGF and the success it had in Hindi, right? everyone earlier used the label of Bahubali, which was really fantasy and so it was agnostic to regions. It was set in a period that everyone could relate to. KGF is set in the 70s and the 80s and it traveled and it had about north of 50, 60 crores as a top film in Canada. I think it was the first top film in Canada. On that point, has the consumer taken any more in the last 30 years or only the access has changed? Is so there access the same thing? Yeah, I can, I can answer. There, I, think, I, don't, I think the consumers evolve, right? I think there's different sets of consumers watching television and there's different sets of consumers watching this because uh, the new set of consumers have been exposed to a lot of the shows originally that started off in the US with the likes of Netflix, who do uh, Prime Video themselves. And a lot of the kind of top five to six cities got access and the penetration started with the classic kind of earlier top And I think that started off as a culture, um, and then that, that culture kind of translated to what India has to present in terms of original programming. So, picking into what my colleagues have said, I think it's important to be true to your story because that's where the audiences start drawing in. Um, I think we spend a lot of time on languages, but I think with like globalization, you know, you can buy the same piece of clothing anywhere around the world. Essentially, content travels better, or even like music, music and content travel better than potentially like commerce. We we hold this debate in English and mostly what is speaks English is the first primary language. When you see consumption of entertainment and we see television we see OTT, perhaps less than five percent is in English. What really is the future of English content produced in India on these services? I'll try and answer that question in two parts. I'll just take the conversation forward here. I think uh, all content is very catering to a need state. Right, to us, if it's a voyeuristic thing state or a excitement, escape, there is something that the consumer is actually wanting to watch to satisfy the state. That would come from any story or any language. We'll watch Narcos in Spanish and read the subtitles and be very happy. KGF is a great example. That story is travel. If the consumer is wanting to watch that story, he's in the mood to watch crime, in the mood to watch something, he will find the content that he's looking for. It's not growing. But in English, the only point is that if it is only in English, Right? That to me, at a scale operation, you negate a huge amount of audience for sure. Because if it just becomes English, then you have negated a huge audience as such. But if you are aware to like a particular language, even with that English option, probably the story will go a lot further. So, you, the, so the availability of the story in multiple languages is important. Which language then becomes largely a strategic market sizing kind of. Are you planning an entirely English product? For us, uh, at that scale, it's really tough. I don't <laughs> think we'll ever No, I think there's a different way to look at this, right? English was restricted in terms of distribution because cable operators and channels controlled in terms of what frequency it ran on based on the carriage. Right? So you can't say English didn't travel beyond a certain point. But at scale, if you look at quality stories that are relevant and that makes sense, and people can associate with, it's definitely, but one thing I can tell you for sure, that English will be a larger percentage share over the overall consumption than the percentage share it saw in television. That's pretty certain. Because if there's quality story then people will watch it. It doesn't matter the language. English is also kind of, again, taking some of maybe heaven is a kind of different kind of English, right? So lots so I'm of talking, when I refer to English programming, I'm talking about LA-based, studio-based, shows that are made in the US. This is what Made in Heaven is, or what we do with smoke shows like that, is basically what we call as a spoken language. If a spoken language is a mix of English and Hindi, then that spoken language that's more locally curated and created. Um, these are what we call as classic export, or the imports rather, which are shows made for a certain audience, but if it's a good story, what we can guarantee is English will travel better than it did in television, 
what that percentage is, is going to be a lunatic case. Right. Yes, please. We have effectively existing law name laws in this. Currently, the biopic of Sadi Yonin, which is called Z5 platform. I'm doing very well. And of course, doing very well. Um, its original version was in English because, of course, we had to true, remain true to the story. And because she was born in Canada and raised there, obviously she would speak English. It would be you know, unfair to make her speak in Hindi at all. So the original show is some bit of Hindi, a lot of English, and Punjabi. That is the language she spoke with her family. And um, all initial research before we launched the show said that. It's me, bahut English. There's a lot of English here in this. A lot of our accent couldn't be followed, and of course, we uh, aided it with subtitles. And then the feedback was, "Ye bahut jaldi jata hai." You know, it's too fast to read subtitles. So now on the Z5 platform, you have a Karanjit Kaur, which is an English, a pure Hindi version of it, which is very desi, which is you know, if 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 there were a commercial film on Sunny Leone's life, that's what it would be. A Tamil version, a Bangla version, a Marathi version, Telugu version, and a Malayalam version. And let me tell you that the Hindi, Tamil, and the Malayalam version are the most shocking of all. Right. Jyoti, when I speak to my friends in television and content creators, and they want to enter a new market, they want to understand the, the culture, the base level consumer. And what inspires them to watch content preservation? When I speak to the web service uh, agents, they try to kind of push the boundary. They want to experiment a little. They want to take the society to the next level. How do you balance the two? I mean, are you going to change the society? Are you going to emanate from the society? And how do you want to make it? You are, you are casting a new market altogether. So, as I said, um, there is already some learnings of a particular segment in a particular consumption form. For example, we've seen a lot of traction of all our content on a DTH platform, which is a DTH value-added services over and above your normal data sky pack. You can buy another service, uh, and we power a lot of those services for the last two and a half years. We've seen some tremendous traction for paid content happening out there. So that's one learning, and we take all those learnings to decide: okay, this is the kind of traction, this is the kind of content, these are the kind of films, these are the kind of shows. That will actually work in that kind of a market or in that for that kind of a segment. We have some sort of a run up to learning on that front. Right? Yeah, so but again, it's a bit of a popular narrative I hear in Delhi market and square. Consumers. I want to think because this content was never available to us elsewhere. In a sense, because it's not available on television, is the reason some of the content actually has been loved and appreciated by audiences. So, so how do you balance the two of learning of the past, which is perhaps doing the same or more the same? What's it doing new? So we see it as uh, two parts of the same coin, or two sides of the same coin. Uh, there is, of course, the new and the fresh content that's available and that is supposed to be created. Uh, frankly, we look at it from a profitability point of view. It's still a while away, and it probably will be a burn game for the next five years. Uh, we also see on the other side of that same coin, we see that uh, there's a huge amount of traction for existing content being replayed on another device. And uh, consumed, and there's a huge traction, smaller segments, but a lot of traction for people to pay for the same service on OTT. And I'm seeing that already happening in the last quarter of our launch. Which I want to write, of course, is a lady who has power of 50,000 content pipeline coming every year. So, my question to you is and I'm sure you can also can open those pipes if you wish to. Uh, how much content, original content, is actually enough? We have a major player who doesn't do more than 800 hours of original content a year, does it has to live around the world? That's a really interesting question. Um, there's really no magic number. And um, what we believe is impactful content. So, all along, the, through our evolution into where we are and where we're going, um, our goal is to be able to bring to our customers consistently content that reflects their tastes and preferences in the most impactful manner. So when it comes to movies, we go after the latest and greatest and we try and bring it at the earliest window possible. So that's something that we do. When it comes to original series, we do not wish to compromise on the same cinematic vision whatsoever and we recognize that it takes time. And so we're willing to curate the content and give it, give it as much time as it takes to get to a, get to some kind of a reasonable cadence, which is 
If you look at the paths, we had one show in 2017, we had five last year, this year we will exit with 10 and hopefully you know, 12 and thereafter. So it takes time. But frankly, I don't believe that we are at a stage uh, where the customers are thumping um, on our doors and saying, I need X number of hours or Y number of hours. What they're really asking for is, tell us great stories. Um, we, do have a, we do have a very uh, strong ambition to be able to tell fresh narratives to existing themes. We do believe customers today are in an evolutionary society and so certain entertainment mediums point them to what was or what is, we are about what can be or what truly is. And so there are all of those creative decisions to be taken. So insofar as we are concerned, I'm, I'm very happy that there are you know, multiple services that have different pipelines and that have you know, broadcast input and so on and so forth. We believe that you know, ultimately the customer is the one who's going to make the choice and she's pretty smart. Okay, you've done tremendous work on in consumer research. You have all these things, tools, all the techniques available. When a consumer moves from platform A to B, generally, without naming anyone, what is the one broad reason he starts a new subscription? Well, I can't speak for movement, but I can definitely give a share with you why she would why she would start um, watching Prime Video. A um, couple of reasons. Um, the first one is the overall experience itself, and I'm going to bundle that with content, the UX, the convenience, um, the multi-device, the, the proprietary software that allows you to set your own data quality and then put your restrictions. But when you have journey, you know, the question is, when you have journey, you have people leaving Prime Video to another platform. What triggers that? We haven't seen much of it, so <laughs> frankly, uh, you know, I guess it, it's also to do with the fact that the Prime Benefits program is a pretty solid one. I mean, if you think about it, at 9.99, there's uh, shipping, shopping, music, Prime Video, now Prime Reading. So there's a whole bunch of benefits. So I think it's also about long-term value. You know, that's the point that I keep going back to. That it's really going to be about the the user experience and the value. And this, if you you know. Staying committed to that yeah. will make sure that you know, you're the preferred choice, and that's what we're after. By the way, you'll be betting on churn, right? You must be betting on churn of the existing players for your services to then grow. What would kind of you kind of, I know you have an A-board model, is, at a model level it's still very different, kind of track more than consumer. But what would be kind of you offered as a different, buying different content and kind of different content? What I have only one proposition, I'm free. I think we sat in this country, I believe, generally. So in terms of churn, really, I think I think consumers really chase shows, okay. right? It, they, there is a, there's a very serious brand value that most of us are trying to build. Uh, over a period of time, we will build the stickiness of the brand, for sure. But I genuinely believe that consumers generally go after shows. If they want the show and they want to watch it, they will go and find it out. If you have to pay for it, they will. If you don't have to, they won't. But it's just that that show must be excited. So I think people chase shows a lot, and the stickiness therefore is created by the brand and the experience and all that. So churn is not something that I generally bother about. I don't have it. I believe we are at a stage where the industry is, uh, or the customers are all about being content loyal and not platform loyal. So whenever you find some new show happening, you'll end up all hoarding out there, taking the subscription, finishing it off and then coming back to another platform for the next show or next content piece. And uh, again, coming back to the same, same story and the same logic, if you find someone who's a classic lover, he will come to the same platform that he finds a whole lot of classics. He won't want to go to multiple platforms to get that kind of content. So, I got the question about consumer chasing shows, not necessarily platforms. And there's also a big debate about the scale of the show. We know the kind of scale of the show is only increasing every kind of quarter. Uh, how do you look at scale of the show per se when it comes to kind of attracting new consumers? So for our shows, we go right at the top of the funnel. So I don't think we compromise because um, as Gotham's got the slight bit of luxury of being free to the customer, we don't have the luxury of being free to the customer. So we're slightly dependent on the subscription rather than the advertiser kind of budget rolling into us. So I think uh, we in fact go higher. So we go higher on the premiumness uh, of the show in terms of the caliber of how the consumer experience is. Um, a lot of this actually in this context has not been talked about, but technology plays a massive role in our business, right? which did really exist in the case of films, some in the case of television, but 
Uh, we have not talked about data, we have not talked about all the new formats of technology entering the concept of video. So the kind of experiences we will be able to create some things we are already working on uh, will be for the first time viewers will be looking at it because they haven't engaged with it at that level. So uh, whether it's technology experiences or content experiences, we actually are not wary of the budget, we go right at the top of the funnel. Vijay, uh, we both mentioned about content. Content. I have a feeling you may not agree with that. You may have people changing platform as much as being a platform or loyal to platform is part of your strategy. Well, the goal is to earn loyalty, obviously, so I can't speak to that. What is important is that, I mean, sure, people chase content, uh, but I disagree that people should chase only shows. Uh, and it's really important to recognize that, you know, no two people's contents, content preferences are the same. And it's also equally important to recognize that an individual customer's moods change across the day. So it's really important to be able to provide a compelling variety. Yeah. So sure, they come in for the content, and, and it's important for us to keep them really engaged by giving them a compelling variety of content. But I don't think it just shows that they go after. I mean, it, 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 there are so many inputs to that. The amount of time you have, what kind of a mood you're in, you know, what kind of a day you had. There's just a lot of that, and, and then we've seen even among the shows, uh, uh, a show made for really young people, Comic Stan, being enjoyed by 45, 50 year olds because you know everybody loves to have a laugh, uh, and so it, it's it's really important to be able to provide a wide variety of compelling uh, pieces of content across formats because that's what drives engagement, and it's really day one for us. So we're not going to be um, you know, taking a floor of the gas anytime soon. Uh, about the prime time television is well understood. What's really mean prime time for OTT? Is it different than we have? <laughs> I understand you're on demand, which is great service, we have a differentiator. But is there a prime time, peak time, peak day? Uh, well, uh, the 24 by 7 uh, watch doesn't go away, but the fact remains that we do see peak in the evenings. Okay. So 7 p.m. onwards, you will see a clear peak. So we people can, are just working at work office, right? They're not yeah, working yeah, at work office. Yeah. Some of them are driving. The lucky ones are, are driving home at uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, mornings 10 to 12, we tend to see good peaks. Weekends are definitely the best. So whether it's weekends, whether it's long holidays, we, start, we love Friday holidays and Monday holidays, both of us. Um, and while uh, TV would have uh, really worried about long holidays and, and that our numbers would drop, OTT and all of us, I'm sure, see great consumption, great, great, great bit viewing. Yeah, and it's after 11. Yeah, we, we peak after 11 because most of uh, our consumers would start watching something at 9, 9.30 and then would continue watching it till the VR. So what do you think is the reason? Television would not serve these audiences or you serve something different? Because television assumed the audience is gone, media kind of spread audience are not there, the ad dollars are not there. Television would be episodic in uh, nature, right? So you would have to go on Monday to Friday to finish watching your show. And then after 11 p.m. would be the so called uh, uh, matured uh, time band. So but they were still put the best movies. I mean, channels are already for hours. You see English movie channel, Indian movie channel, they put the best. Yeah, it, uh, I guess it's more of a convenience uh, factor that you like something and you just want to finish it. Most of us are comp creating such compelling content that after your after the first episode, you want to binge view and see what happens next. But is it like a me time? So I think the, the answer to your question is that that catered to a different demographic. Right? If that catered to essentially driven the mass market is male, female, above 30, 35. They're actually catering to a different kind of demographic, or rather psychographic of audience. It's not even a demographic of audience. Hence, their behavior patterns, their daily patterns, their need gaps are completely different. You're trying to kind of start with a certain uh, core and then create that core to become a larger subset. Uh, of the it's the same person, 11 o'clock, the person doesn't change Not necessarily. So what we experienced, because I was in Viacom also, we were part of the launch team of colors, right? So what we experienced at that point was the fact is that there were people that were watching shows like even Brody's uh, during the same time in terms of catch up on YouTube during prime time back. So it's actually because India is a single TV household phenomenon per se, a lot of the younger audiences are actually watching it on their digital platform forms in the team, same time band, sitting in the same family group. So what you're getting is similar patterns to television in terms of viewership peaks, but the program is catered to different psychographic. And I think that's the core of issue. Right. Uh, about the early days, but I want to ask you something. I mean, what's really surprised you about your job? I mean, you know, in the sense of response, 
success, failures besides bosses? Uh, no, I think uh, it's just generally the scale of who we're trying to target. It's a mammoth task to try and understand this, you know, mask India, and understand, like they said, that there are many Indians to understand what is it that they would want to watch, why is it that they would want to watch, draw up some hypothesis, try and make some programming. Unfortunately for all of us, you know, it takes, by the time you understand this audience, and by the time you actually create the program, it's a year down the line. And data is changing literally every day. So, you know, it's kind of a, it, it, the most interesting part is how do you actually understand this amount of data that's actually you're being captured. And then from a content perspective, because if you want to deliver quality content, it cannot be delivered quickly. Let's be honest. Right? Anything that is slightly premium has to have that, that cycle trying to understand what works, what doesn't work. Uh, the most interesting part of my uh, thing is that it generally at that scale of operation and that number of people, how do you really pick, how do you make sure that, how many of them are universal shows, how many of them are specific shows, it's literally the multiplex, single screen arguments at any point in time. Is the argument was saying that everybody, uh, if you ask a movie producer today, is, I mean, he will never tell you, oh, this is only for this set of audience. Everybody wants to do the Kangal because that's the way it goes, right? The more broad-based the audience, the more the numbers. I guess it's it's, it's all about that. But, uh, yeah, I think that's the most interesting part. Plus, the, the problem that I think all of us on the table are facing is that we all do want to create that premium, premium content and premium business. The talent pipeline isn't that big. That's the other challenge that I think we all face. The, the other end, to create it as well, there is an ecosystem that exists for television, there is an ecosystem for feature film, there is an ecosystem for advertising. There is no ecosystem for 200 to 400 minutes of premium content that exists. We are all trying to figure this out and create that ecosystem together. And I think we all benefit over a period of three to four years. Okay. Okay, now we are all friends here. I mean, so you can use internet to Is there a piece of content you wish had on your platform, you, you know, got your hands on that piece, which perhaps could not be a platform. Is this something you admire a lot? Uh, as a person, it would be very different, but from a, from a platform point of view, we are programming for the mass Indian, and we are very proud about that strategy, right? Uh, fact remains, the, the international platforms who have a legacy of a whole lot of international content will, um, I would say not just take time, but will still uh, cut across different audience sets very, very differently. We cater to the, the, the Bharat, right? I mean, while of course the distinction between the India Bharat and you see the lines blurring and things like that. Where is India left anymore? I mean, I don't see any India, I only see Bharat everywhere. <laughs> True. Uh, yes, and that's uh, that's really the huge the huge tempo revolution with the geo and things. It's all Bharat anymore. It's not just you know those premium tempo uh, players anymore. So um, from from our platform point of view, we are really happy with the kind of content we are making, the kind of pipeline we have, because these are all stories that are going to be very real, very re relevant, and are going to resonate with the Indian masses. That's really where. Uh, you know, I mean, personal preference would be anything different, but we hardly represent any person of the population. Everyone in this room is, is hardly, uh, is a very small percent. Which it, it said that you stop growing when you become very comfortable. So what are the steps you take to keep your team uncomfortable? Oh, um, I don't have to do much. One of the um, most spoken of uh, and, you know, one of the most fetid uh, philosophies at Amazon is day one. Uh, some of you will have heard it. Uh, some of you may have read a bit about it. And um, Jeff Bezos has this really interesting philosophy that keeps the company's culture rooted to day one. So there's a set of characteristics that are defined which all of us embrace. Um, the minute you walk into the portals of Amazon and you're constantly tested for it. Um, I don't want to belabor it because it's going to sound kind of, uh, you know, pedantic and I don't mean that. But it is really very interesting. Um, you could you could see his uh, talks on on day one and day two culture as they, as in a in I think the last shareholders meeting was asked the question. So what is day two according to you? And it was pretty pretty stark. So I think that's that's a um, you know that's it's an overall culture in the company and it's fan, it's fantastic. It, it applies to all of us. I think the other interesting thing that that also comes through is that you know we presented with such a 
amazing opportunity to do, bring so many great Indian stories to the fore. I think it will be, it'll be a sad day if we actually rest on our models and say, oh, I think we've told a few new stories and we're all very happy about it. I mean, we are such a, this is a great time to be in this environment, you know, doing the work that we're doing. So, I think that itself keeps me paranoid. Uh, we'll, we'll take a few questions from the audience. Uh, Yes, please. Hi. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, mostly as SVOD platforms, uh, how much has piracy kind of uh, affected your business and how do you plan to curb it in the coming days? You want to answer that? Yeah. Yeah, so I think in coming days. Uh, no, so I think. Uh, the way we try to fight piracy, at least that's the culture that we come from, is that we make it, like we almost make the pirate feel sad and bad about the fact that he's pirating, or he or she is pirating, right? That's the logic. So make it affordable, make the user experience great, make the ease of access, ease of payment, uh, all those functionalities so simple and create such a fabulous value that you're able to convert the pirate into um, almost making like them feel bad about the fact that they're pirating this piece of code. Right. We're not there as yet, but we're in that process or in that direction of making that happen. And I think from a regulatory perspective also, there's a lot of things that will potentially, and technology will play a key role in terms of, you know, whether it was a lot of the Pirate Bay kind of sites, torrent sites that were kind of curbed and controlled, there's a little bit of cleanup. So I think it will be a joint effort on the infrastructure side of things and the regulator side of things, and even with all platforms, with the education that we're passing on. Uh, to the audiences, right? Rather than going to that store and buying that pirated DVD or downloading it off the torrent, it's almost like all this marketing and all this investment is also going and partially educating the audiences. So I think movies suffers the most. I don't see TV getting that much pirated. Some of the originals also have been pirated. We heard of obviously what happened with the Game of Thrones, but I'm saying that what we're trying to do is almost make that feel bad. Uh, are you greater than not greater than motivation to pirate? I don't know. Uh, it's so the greater the conversion for us to, to deliver great value to the customers. I mean, she's smart. If she sees great value, well, then there's no reason because this is so much more convenient. No, I think also like the experience, right? Right now we just talked about HD, you know, there's 4K, 8K, there's AR, VR, there's immersive video. Pirates won't want to do any of this. I mean, you look at the future of video per se, the future of video piracy is not going to be relevant because you can't pirate this per se. So. Hey. Yeah, tech will solve a lot of problems, for sure. Hi, this is Ulas, and my question is to Gautam. So, uh, we have seen uh, evolution in terms of uh, uh, distribution of television in India, like DTH coming in, into the picture. Would MX player will play the same role, like? Everybody will contact you and you will be playing it free for the audience, like she said, people like content free. And through you, they will, you know, uh, came into our phone, like DTP will start, direct to phone. Uh, I'm not so sure in terms of we just be aggregated, that's not the, that's not the model alone. The, uh, the kind of partnership you are having and the content yes. on the next year, like developing uh, very speedily. Yes, it's, it's the scale that we that we operate. There's a Zoom discussion platform that we do offer to content creators, and which is why we are partnering with them. And they find value in that partnership, which is why they are also on board with us. Uh, we make sure that the content gets uh, you know, distributed to a new set of audiences, and a new set of audiences for their pieces of content. Uh, but it's not only an aggregator model, I guess. We're doing our own business to make sure that, that uh, there is enough more traction that comes out of that. Also. So it's not just an aggregation. We can take just one last question. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, this question can be answered by anyone. Now, I am really intrigued to know, apart from subscription fees, uh, what are the revenue options that you have? Uh, and uh, is there going to be a change in that? Uh, are you trying to tap into different uh, revenue options? Everybody has different revenue models, so we can take another question. Yes, sir. My name is Siraj Sayyid, I'm from filmfestivals.com. The question is to uh, Uh You've been a player in the, the media and entertainment sector for about 50 years now, like you said. 
But the overwhelming uh, content uh, that you had earlier was all film based, or in fact, feature films themselves. So, are you able to monetize any of that right now on OTT, or uh, do you have to depend on entirely new content that you acquire? So, like I just said uh, during the panel discussion, was that this is a there are there's an entire sect of audiences uh, of the Bharat that we are talking of, which are diehard fans of older content or of of that kind of content. They are fans. To that extent, we've seen comments on various social platforms of ours where you see guys who are fans who have gone and watched a dawn of Amitabh's first dawn about 372 times. And then we've got similar such kind of numbers and astronomical numbers of fanatics of that kind of content. And what they've been in fact pushing us very subtly in various forums is that can we have one destination to drive and consume this content? And lo and behold, we got the platform built in that breath itself to cater to that audience who says, I want great content which I have experienced all my childhood and can I have it at one place? Because right now, supply and availability of going and finding it on 20 different platforms is a challenge for me. And for that, I'm willing to pay. So, thank you very much. And thank you all of you for joining this panel. And uh, it can be yours. And so we drop there, and you guys can sit back and enjoy it. So I've got a couple of, um, but I guess one major secret that I should probably share with you, uh, and that is this. Well, hang on a second. I can do it on this thing. Uh, it is this. Yeah, uh, I'm Irish. And I've been living in Moscow for about 13 years. And guys, I can't tell you how hard it is to try to persuade the Russians to allow me to go to India to talk about the Russians. Yeah? So the fact that I'm here in the first place represents a great success. And uh, we should thank, uh, I should thank my team uh, that I work with in Moscow uh, for you know, giving me the opportunity to get down here. So today we're going to talk to you a little bit about two projects. Uh, 1917 Live and Romanov's 100. 1917 Live uh, was a year-long, 12,000-tweet historic role-play that answers the question, what if Twitter existed 100 years ago? And it tells the story of 1917 in Russia, Russia's revolutions, in real time uh, for, for 12 months. It ran for 12 months. Uh, the tweets remain online, and we've also downloaded the entire database, which we make available to research institutions, to historians, historiographers, and anybody who's interested in working with that kind of content. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted to say that, uh, we've already struck up a couple of contracts with research institutions and we're taking that on. Uh, Romanov's 100 is a photo-based social media documentary uh, that works with 4,000 photographs that were taken by Russia's last royal family uh, to piece out a picture of what we would call uh, a lost Russia. Uh, the materials for all projects are available at these two websites. Everything from uh, you know, the, the, the tweets the Instagram posts, the YouTube videos, uh, through to the promotional material, which I'll certainly hope to focus, focus on with you today. Uh, I want to also um, thank the guys from the previous panel and certainly thank my fellow speakers today because it's been amazing uh, to come so far and to realize that the principles uh, of our work are absolutely one and the same. And I'll be speaking a little bit about authenticity uh, to you today and how uh, we managed to realize that in our work. Um, so, our storytelling was largely based on uh, these three principles. Get your audience in, give them something to remember your content by, give them something to talk about, and then to inspire them to learn. Um, I think that's probably the end goal for pretty much all of us in the, in the room right now, and I think that's where audiences are going. Uh, my own background was in uh, journalism and social media. I watched uh, in a Moscow newsroom as uh, social media collided into the news industry 
And uh, I'm not sure about you guys, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that the result was not entirely pretty. But what we do have as a result of that <coughs> excuse me, is very savvy consumers who demand integrity from start to finish in storytelling and demand authenticity because they're aware of the dangers out there in the digital environment. Stories, uh, Annie Murphy Paul wrote the stories that she says they have the capacity uh, to reach the capacity of the brain to construct a map of other people's intentions, a theory of mind. Narratives, are, narratives offer a unique opportunity to engage this capacity as we identify the characters' longings and frustrations, guess at their hidden motives, and track their encounters with friends and enemies, neighbors and lovers. So in this sense, we're speaking about stories and not scripts. Stories spark the imagination. They trigger a reflection through which learning occurs, a different kind of learning that inscribes itself on memory. Tyler Nakatsu of JFF Labs uh, added on that. To reach this, we need storytelling that answers what's at stake for characters and choice points when an action or decision occurs that reflects a value or a moral. This relationship between memory and learning is built on a reflexivity that the audience now undertakes and it's often triggered by an experience when expectations are disrupted. Now, speaking of disrupting expectations, one of, a great example, uh, I don't know if you've seen this, but this is a documentary uh, uh, that was, uh, well, it's a piece of art, in my opinion, that was done by Peter Jackson, the Lord of the Rings director, who took World War I footage uh, and uh, submitted it to his team, and they retreated it, and they've mixed, they've colorized and added depth to this extraordinary footage to give it a new life. And I think it's fair to say, that the creative seeds for 1917 Live were sown for us in 2014 as Europe marked 100 years since the beginning of World War I, as the world did in fact. And at the time, Europe was slipping into a populism uh, and a reactionary kind of politics. Uh, and we saw parallels between what was happening in Europe in 2014 and uh, the outbreak of World War I. Uh, in 2016, we watched a single social media account tell day-to-day -day events of the Irish Rising, the Irish Revolution, which happened in 1916 and kind of sparked uh, the final push towards uh, independence uh, from the British Empire, uh, and which triggered a civil war in 1922. But we knew what was coming in 1917, and we set out to build something new. And 30 international prizes later, speaking to, to you here today in Mumbai, or from India, I can pretty safely say I think we did okay. So, in 2017, as the world marked the centenary of the Russian Revolution's events that changed the course of global history, we asked ourselves, how can we tell such a complicated story for the social media age? How will the stories be told? What would people say on public platforms that were open to almost all? Which platform would this particular political, polarized, dramatis personae publish on? Uh, and how would they convey these slow-moving events uh, that changed the course of history. So we asked ourselves, what if Twitter existed uh, 100 years ago? For 1917, we built a cast of 50 dramatis personae, 50 characters, around a fictitious newspaper. Uh, it was called the Russian Telegraph initially, and after the revolution, it became the Revolutionary Times. Most characters were real historical figures, but we did use some ideal types. Uh, for example, we used a Petrograd baker uh, who was getting really pissed off about the fact that the government was fucking up and the police couldn't get flour to his mill. And he would tweet daily about the fact that, like, police can't, police can't guarantee the security in my city, this is sad! Exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Echoing a particular politician I think we're all familiar with at the moment. Uh, we offered our audience the chance to create historical avatars of their own. And we, they were largely based on authentic characters of that period. And dozens joined in, many of whom were academics, historians, but then a community emerged with history buffs and people who really just wanted to participate. Our success with 1917 Live was built on that of Twitter, whose motto was what used to be, what's happening now. This is when Twitter would talk to us, by the way. They wouldn't talk to us so much. So we were able to build out real-time mini narratives like this. We were able to convey the kind of relentless day-to-day slow-moving experiences uh, that you don't often see in uh, in history books, and uh, this is the example of Vladimir Lenin's famous journey in a closed train from Switzerland uh, through Germany, Sweden, and then eventually to Petrograd. And we had a Lenin tracker online, and his tweets were 
we're being uh, busted up on that, we were able to play with the character. But it also allowed us to kind of step away from that kind of Hollywoodization of history and present history as a slow moving and real, real event, real phenomenon. So let me uh, give you an example of uh, how we work. Guys, can you bring up the audio? That we might have audio. You don't have audio? You get the audio feel of the... No. It's dead. Okay. That's how it is. Start it. There we go. We had audio this morning, but we don't seem to have audio now. Okay. Are we initial things too long? Yeah, we'll stop. system, a video ecosystem. So this comes back to, I think, some of the issues that you guys have been talking about today, but some of the issues that, that were talked about in a couple of brilliant workshops yesterday, too, about layering through storytelling and adding kind of platform layers around that. So we started uh, with uh, a series of uh, Twitter characters. Now, I should say, when we started this in the, in the Moscow newsroom, it wasn't really regarded as a good idea. The newsroom thought this was a bit too niche and they really didn't want to get us particularly behind it. So this was three guys that started this who would put together, put together the content for the next day, at night, having put the kids to bed, et cetera, et cetera. After three, three months into this project, uh, we submitted for a shorty, and we won a shorty for education. One of us went to New York, came back with a shorty prize, we put it on the table in the network, and said, guys, we just won a shorty, and they said, that was freaking awesome, guys, would you like to speak to the video guys about maybe doing some content around that, would you like to build it out? So it became, uh, a much more sophisticated storytelling uh, operation once we got involved with the promotional team, about whom I'll speak later. This was a Vladimir and Anna uh, Periscope uh, that went very well in an authentic recreation of the highlight. I'll talk a bit more about that in a sec. Uh, we can, and this is a 360 series that we made, the game that told the story around uh, uh, Moscow and Petrograd, uh, particularly during that time. Now, our work on 1917 Live brought us into regular contact with the Russian state archives. Why? Because content is king. You can't just publish your text tweets, people aren't going to engage with that. We needed documents, PDFs, pictures, and file footage. So during, the, uh, during our work in the archives, we came across a large trove of photographs that had been taken by the Romanov family themselves. Uh, they were counter geeks. And we uh, persuaded the archive to allow us work with them. They digitized these photographs for us, and we built a project known as Romanov's 100 out of that. The, uh, the project itself, I think, is probably, it's, it's a visual, day, visual storytelling project rather than a kind of narratively driven storytelling project, and, it's, and, and it works in a, in a slightly different way. Let's take it on. So the Romanovs, is, is, as we now know, they were photography pioneers. They owned the first Kodak cameras, and they owned panorama cameras. So panoramas were being taken in 1903, uh, using Kodaks, even if not a little bit before that. They weren't invented by Apple, let's just be very clear about that. Uh, and the, uh, the Romanovs also had a workshop in their palace where they developed the photographs and they would even colorize some of the photographs. However, this extraordinary trove of photographic uh, archive was kept obviously in the dark during Soviet rule and we were the first guys in there to have an opportunity to work with these photographs in a new way give them a new second digital life. 
In our campaign methodology, we decided to focus on single photographs and try to build out backstories. And I'll show you a couple of promos, which I'm really hoping will have audio. But anyway, we'll see how we go. So we turned 4,000 photographs of them by the last Russian royal family into image-first social media narratives. Accounts over four social media networks review the last decades of the Russian Empire as seen through the lenses and the eyes of the Romanov family. And every published photograph was thoroughly researched to create platform native storytelling. So one of the most important decisions we made in telling both stories was choosing which platform we publish on and in what way. Each has a voice, a cachet, a demographic, a mode. I think we're all entirely familiar with uh, uh, the, the